Hi, welcome everyone. We're gonna wait just a minute or two for folks to enter into the room. We look forward to talking with you. Okay, great. Um, so we're so excited that you all uh, attended our Ask a Paleontologist event. This is our first event um, and we're so excited to be here. What we're going to do today is each of us is going to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about what we do. And after we introduce ourselves, we're each going to answer two questions, two to three questions that were previously submitted. We did group some questions together. So keep an eye out for your questions because these are the questions that we're going to start answering. Um, so I'm going to go first because we are going to start in the most recent time period known as the Pleistocene and we're going to travel back in time about 550 million years. Um, and then we're going to rotate around. At the very end, we are going to um, all do your live Q&A. Any questions that you may have that we didn't get a chance to answer, you can type into the Q&A and we'll try to go ahead and answer many of those. Real quick, I'm just going to briefly introduce our panel. So we have Dr. Rachel, who studies lots of marine mammals. We have Dr. Simon, who studies things from the Ediacaran, so 550 million years ago. We have Dr. Neil, who studies lots of really cool animals that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. Um, and then I am Dr. Larissa, and I studied Pleistocene mammals. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and show you some really fun fossils, and we'll meet all of these other paleontologists momentarily. All right, so thank you again. All right, so this is one of my favorite places to go look for fossils. And if anyone can look at the map, you might be able to guess where this is. So the great thing about Zoom is you can scream it at the top of your lungs. One, two, three, where do you think I am? Okay, if you guessed Australia, you were correct. So Australia is a great place to look for fossils because there are so many fossils from our recent past, but they also had lots of really bizarre animals. They had giant goanna-like animals that are potentially venomous, giant birds. They had giant wombat-like animals, this one here called a diprotodon, and it was the size of a rhino. They had giant short-faced kangaroos that are taller than me and taller than your parents. Um, and they also had a marsupial lion, which is a really bizarre animal. It's not related to lions at all. It had a pouch, but it was a big carnivorous animal. And so Australia is a really fun place because all of these animals are preserved. Uh, up here is a beautiful fossil locality located in the middle of Australia um, near a place called Alice Springs. And I use lots of different tools to actually study fossils. I actually love also going into the museum collections. When I open drawers like this, it's a dream come true. I can study all sorts of different fossils and I'm gonna show you how I do that. So here's a little quick video that shows, oop, little technical difficulty there. We're gonna try that again. Uh-oh, I'm actually, it looks like we're, oop. it looks like my PowerPoint decided to shut down. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Rachel, Dr. Rachel real quick, um, and I will come back to you uh, to talk about the Pleistocene once I work out the technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Alrighty, hi everybody. Um, let me just get my thing going. Um, here we go. Um, so, hi, I'm Dr. Rachel, and this is a picture of me when I was excavating a fossil whale out of um, the rock in Iceland, which doesn't really have um, a lot of sedimentary rock in general, but uh, we did happen to find this uh, baleen whale in that rock, and it was also really convenient because in the water just to the right, there in this picture, we can also see living whales um, swimming around whenever we needed to take a break. So that's also pretty cool because I study both fossil and modern uh, whales and marine mammals um, to understand how they evolved over time. Um, whales evolved from four-legged ancestors um, about 50 million years ago. 
uh, they started to become fully, mostly fully aquatic by 50 million years ago. This um, animal at the top here is a four-limbed animal, a close relative of whales, that as you can see is already semi-aquatic, but you can also see it still has those four limbs. Um, and then this other bottom bit is kind of a snapshot through time of different whales at different stages of evolution when they, some of them have hind limbs still, but then they slowly became over time more equipped for a fully aquatic lifestyle, losing those hind limbs. And also in some whales, um, what's really cool is some whales um, be, evolved the ability to echolocate. And echolocation is kind of seeing with sound which is really useful in low light environments or in the dark. Um, bats also echolocate. So it's a way to sort of make sounds through various um, ways, particularly in whales. Uh, and then the, those sounds are reflected back so that they can hear them and they kind of get an image of whatever object they're looking at. For example, in this case, a fish or, an, or the, basically it helps them navigate as well. So they can also, it reflects back whatever is around them. So um, this evolution of echolocation it required a lot of uh, different anatomical adaptations and that's what I'm really interested in. And as you can see in this picture and this next picture there's a lot of internal uh, features that are really interesting that um, allow them to echolocate and it's part of the streamlining of their body as well. And some of you may know about the melon in whales. This is um, a fatty structure that they um, that helps uh, focus or acts kind of as a lens of the sounds that they're producing that then um, reflect back to them. And in order to look on the inside of the skull to understand the, how these things evolved, I use um, X-ray CT, which is basically a modified X-ray. So if you, if somebody um, is hurt or, or breaks a, a limb or something, breaks a bone or something, sometimes you might go to the doctor and they might need to um, CT scan you. Um, again, it's a modified X-ray and then they'll be able to understand what's going on on the inside of you um, in that case. And that's kind of a picture on the upper left here of somebody in a, a CT scanner in the medical uh, situation. So we kind of have a modified version of that. Um, the example on the right here at the top is um, my colleague scanning a, a dolphin in a, a smaller kind of scanner. And then you kind of get this series of x-rays that are um, look like kind of slices. And they're, they're actually 3D, so when you put them all together, you can um, reconstruct the inside of certain features. In this case, this is a dolphin ear, and I've reconstructed the, what the shape of the ear bone, uh, the inside of the ear bone looks like. And this is packed with information on um, hearing ability in whales. And this is obviously really important if you're seeing what sound, essentially. And um, obviously also the, the brain is really important and other features and you can scan really large specimens. In this case, this is a porpoise where I also extracted the brain um, and some nervous tissue as well. And so that's kind of what I work on. That's what I would do. Um, I'm gonna move on to the questions that I had from, uh, that were previously given to us. And, and one is, how do you figure out how to put skeletons back together? And so I kind of hinted at this a lot um, in my little introduction. Um, I personally, we can figure it out because we have modern representatives of the animals that we work on. So we know how modern animals are put together so we can use that information to uh, put extinct animals back together. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then what is field work of paleontologists like? And that's a really good question, really interesting question, because it's not the same for everybody. Um, for me, for example, I've done anywhere between um, kind of, it's kind of like hiking where you, if, if you enjoy nature, it's really great because you can go, you have a search image and you're just walking around looking for a bone or um, what, what, what sort of looks like a bone or what looks like a trace that you're expecting to find. And you kind of just have to be able to kind of look and see and, um, like to hike, which is kind of nice. Um, especially if you enjoy nature, you can see things again like whales or other things that are um, all already out there. In the case of the, that whale excavation, we were also using a lot of climbing equipment and kind of repelling off the side of the cliff because it was a cliffside um, excavation, uh, somewhat uh, difficult. Um, but it's not always like really difficult work. Uh, sometimes you can go to a field site that is already well established and has 
basically like a quarry and you can slowly dig away at um, and just slowly discover the fossils that way and not really have to move around that much or, or do anything uh, that active. And again, and not everyone does field work either and it's not a necessary part of being a paleontologist. So um, just, it, it's nice and it, if you like it, but it's not a necessary thing to do. And um, uh, some people don't like it. <laughs> I had a friend who tried it and uh, decided to become a, a chemist instead. And um, that was totally great. She's still a paleontologist who's also um, really focused on geochemistry instead, which is also fine. So that's my end. Does, does Larissa want to, uh, Dr. Larissa want to come back or? Sure, we'll give it a try, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Perfect. All right, we'll give this a second try. Okay, if everyone can see that. So we are, we traveled into the ocean a little bit and now we're traveling back to Australia. Um, so as I mentioned, Australia is one of my favorite places to work. Uh, this is a field site in the middle of Australia. Um, and these are all of the many fossils that we find in the museum collections, which are just so amazing. Um, and I really enjoy field work, but I also enjoy working in the museum. And so here is just sort of a sped up version of me actually looking at some of these specimens. So I also drill them. So I use this little standard uh, drill um, to get the enamel off of these teeth. I collect that enamel on these little tiny pieces of paper put them in these little vials, I label them, and then I bring them back to Vanderbilt where I can then figure out what these animals ate and what the climate was like. So there's a lot of information I can get from their teeth, including sort of their ecology. And we can even do this for humans today, which is really exciting. Um, my other favorite place is the La Brea Tar Pits. And so the La Brea Tar Pits are an amazing place because we still have asphalt sort of coming up. So this is a lake um, where there's a little bit of asphalt on the sides that you'll see. Um, there are kids who have soccer practice and there'll be cones out where the asphalt is still coming up. But the great thing about it is that there's so many fossils. And in part, this is because an herbivore, unfortunately, a plant eating animal, um, will walk and get stuck in this, this tar uh, and essentially not be able to get out. And then the carnivores come along and eat the herbivores. Um, and so in that process, they also get stuck. And so we have millions of fossils that are actually found from La Brea. Here they're housed in all of these drawers. Here you can just see some of the beautiful fossils coming out. And there's even boxes of entire parts of the fossil site. And these are two Vanderbilt students who recently came out to uh, La Brea to study some of these fossils. Um, so you might expect some amazing fossils that you'd find at La Brea include things like saber-toothed cats. So I'm going to come back and talk about this one in, in a few minutes, but essentially this is a saber-toothed cat. Um, we're all so familiar with them because of the hockey team, uh, the Predators, um, but there's also things like dire wolves. So these are dire wolf skulls here, um, and these are dire wolves here. So think of a very large uh, type of a wolf essentially, but there's a lot we're learning about them. So they, they may or may not be um, super closely related to uh, modern wolves, um, but they are sort of like a very large wolf. So lots of exciting things. We have a big project going on there, looking at their ecology, their anatomy, and when these animals existed and how they respond to climate change over the last 50,000 years or so. And what I really love about paleontology is not only working with the fossils, but working with so many incredible people. And so these are all uh, people who can claim to be a paleontologist in some way, shape, or form. They're all students um, who have worked in our labs over the years and have contributed to our knowledge of paleontology over the years. So my question, what is your favorite fossil and why? And I'm going to come back to this. Um, I think living in Nashville and studying saber-toothed cats, it'd be really hard to not say a saber-toothed cat, but there's actually an individual fossil that's my favorite, and that's this one here. Okay, so this is a picture of my daughter a week ago. As you can see, uh, she's lacking lots of teeth, like I'm guessing many of you. 
Um, if I gave her an apple, a whole apple, she'd get really mad at me because there's no way she can actually bite into that apple. Um, she can only chew with her back teeth. And this is really a problem um, if you're a saber tooth cat and you're trying to hunt prey. And so what's really amazing about these saber tooth cats is they have their baby tooth, which is, on, is right here on the outside. And their adult sabers are actually growing in right alongside their baby teeth. So they don't have the problem that my daughter has with lacking all of her front teeth. They essentially grow in that saber right alongside, um, which lets us know how important these sabers are for actual hunting. And if you wanna see more about it, there's an episode on, called Saber Tooth Brawl that you might find interesting. Other question I have is where is the best place to find fossils and also how can I become a paleontologist? So there's a reason why I combine both of these questions and that's because my best advice for anyone who has an interest in fossils is to get out and see the fossils and this can include going to museums, this can also include going to na the um, national parks. So this is a map from the National Park Service showing all of the different places that have fossils um, uh, throughout uh, the U.S., which is quite amazing. And so here we are, and there are fossils here. There is actually an amazing site called the Gray Fossil Site in eastern Tennessee. Fort Negley also has amazing invertebrate fossils found throughout the fort in the limestone. We do a fossils at the fort event um, most years, and so keep an eye out for that. They also do fossil finders where you can look through some of these fossils at Fort Negley, um, and then keep an eye out for all sorts of other um, fossils that might be coming to you. Some museums have giant exhibits that travel around and will, um, will visit actual schools, and so just see what's out there. So I would encourage anyone to get out there to look for fossils, to find fossils, to learn about fossils, and that's really the best way to become a paleontologist. And whether it's getting outside or looking at them in books, um, just, just be curious, ask questions, and learn as much as you can about ancient life. Now, how exactly do we know where to go to find fossils? It depends on what we're looking for. So if I want to find dinosaurs, I'm probably going to go to Utah or Texas or Montana. Um, and that's because the age of the rock that's exposed actually is the same age as when dinosaurs were around. Now, Florida is a horrible place to look for dinosaurs because those sediments aren't there. Um, same for Tennessee. Um, but Tennessee is a great place to find little brachiopods, little invertebrates from when we were underwater. And Florida is an amazing place to find fossil mammals and also shark's teeth. And so real quick, I just want to show you a megalodon shark's tooth. And these are quite amazing. And these are the types of... Um, uh, very large shark, the biggest, lark, the biggest shark that ever lived, and it lived between about 2 and 20 million years ago. So very exciting. Now with that, I'm going to actually pass it on to someone who studies uh, marine reptiles, and that's Dr. Neil. Hello, everyone. Um, so let me get my presentation here. Okay, um, so yeah, if you signed up for this, uh, you might have been thinking you were going to be hearing all day about dinosaurs, because dinosaurs maybe are uh, what we think about first when we think about paleontologists. But it turns out, as you already saw from Dr. Larissa and Dr. Rachel, there are many, many paleontologists who study all kinds of living things, um, animals like uh, whales and saber-toothed cats, uh, but also things like crabs. Uh, and even plants too, trees and flowers and single-celled plankton that lived in the ocean. Um, all of these organisms have left behind a fossil record. Uh, but dinosaurs are a pretty spectacular group that we know about uh, from fossils. And it turns out when dinosaurs were alive in the Mesozoic, uh, about uh, from 250 to 65 million years ago, there were a whole bunch of other reptile groups that lived alongside them. Uh, and so these, even though they lived alongside the dinosaurs, aren't usually or aren't technically classified as true dinosaurs. And they include things uh, like the flying reptiles, pterosaurs, that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit here, but also my favorite group, uh, the marine reptile group. Uh, these were reptiles that lived in the ocean at the same time as the dinosaurs, and they have some similarities with dinosaurs. 
So we classify them as reptiles and they have a relationship with living reptiles today, uh, including crocodiles and snakes and lizards and turtles, um, but also birds, which we'll talk about in a bit as well. They lived during the Mesozoic, so, so marine reptiles lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, although there are still marine reptiles today, things like sea turtles and sea snakes. But all dinosaurs, or almost all dinosaurs, lived on land, and all marine reptiles lived in the ocean. So that's a big difference between the two of them. And all dinosaurs share a common ancestor. They're all closely related to one another, and they're actually closely related to birds. In fact, birds are a special kind of dinosaur. However, what's really cool to me about marine reptiles is that it's not just one group and they don't all have one common ancestor. There are actually many, many different groups, but they all had a similar lifestyle and they all had a similar story. They all started as reptiles living on land and over time they became adapted to living in the ocean uh, and eventually became so adapted to living in the ocean that they couldn't even leave the water anymore. And so in many ways, they were pretty much uh, similar to the whales that Dr. Rachel was talking about, uh, but they lived long before whales uh, that are still with us today. And so one of the groups of marine reptiles that I work on a lot and that is my favorite, uh, per, me, actually my second favorite, I'll, I'll show you my favorite in a second, uh, are the ichthyosaurs. And the ichthyosaurs were dolphin or whale shaped, um, or sometimes people even call them fish shaped, reptiles. Uh, the name ichthyosaur means fish lizard, and they were first discovered by um, a woman paleontologist named Mary Anning, who lived in England in the 1800s, and she used to look for fossils along the seashore and would collect and sell fossils, but uh, also was responsible for finding some of the most important fossil reptile uh, specimens and sharing them with scientists. In fact, this was at a time before dinosaurs were even known about. So marine reptiles were kind of our first glimpse that giant reptiles used to live on planet Earth. And so these ichthyosaurs lived, uh, they evolved around 240 million years ago. And they lived about the same time as the dinosaurs all the way up to the Cretaceous. Uh, but then they went extinct about 110 million years ago. They actually went extinct before the dinosaurs went extinct. So they weren't killed by the meteorite impact that killed the dinosaurs. We're still trying to figure out exactly why they went extinct, but when they went extinct, there were some other reptile groups like mosasaurs that you might've heard of that came on the scene. Um, so there was this really interesting story of different reptile groups evolving to live in the ocean uh, and then living for a time and then going extinct and being replaced by other groups. And that's one of the questions that I'm really interested in is sort of how these different groups of marine reptiles that lived alongside one another, how they interacted with each other and how they uh, interacted with the oceans that they lived in, what role they played in the ocean ecosystems at the time. We think that things like whales are really important in modern e ocean ecosystems. Um, and so we think that the marine reptiles might've been really important as well. So uh, I've shared this picture and obviously it's my background as well. This is the largest ichthyosaur called Shonisaurus. It's the state fossil of Nevada. Although um, actually even larger uh, representatives of the same animal have been discovered in British Columbia. And this is a mural uh, created by an artist, but it gives you an idea of how big these things got. Not as big as a blue whale, but uh, much larger than most toothed whales today, most dolphins, but about as big as a sperm whale, the largest toothed whale today. And so uh, in order to study and learn about these things, we do a combination of field work. And we've, you've already heard about this from the other speakers, going out to look for fossils. And so that involves walking around a lot, looking at the ground, picking up things, trying to figure out if they're a real fossil. Uh, and so if you can see in the picture here, I'm not sure if my pointer is visible to you, but over on uh, the left-hand side, you can see me looking at some fossils that are actually still inside some rocks. We're trying to figure out how to get them out. And then below, you can see some fossils that we found on the ground. These are actually uh, part of the shoulder blades, uh, shoulder girdle of a giant ichthyosaur, of a Shonisaurus. When we find a fossil in the ground, oftentimes we need to protect it when we remove it and we'll wrap it up with plaster and uh, burlap or newspaper. And that's what these people in the top middle are doing here, uh, wrapping up a fossil to safely transport it home. Uh, and you can see um, some examples of other people. And these are uh, students that I've worked with, Vanderbilt students and other students 
uh, that have gone out to look for fossils in the field with me. So that's one part of what I do. But then I also, uh, once you get the fossils back, there's a lot more work to be done in trying to study them and figure out what kind of stories they have to tell us. And so uh, just like you heard about from um, both Dr. Larissa and Dr. Rachel, I also visit museum collections a lot to study uh, the specimens that are there. I've also used um, the CT x-ray scanning like Dr. Rachel was talking about to look inside the skulls of some marine reptiles, just like uh, she was talking about looking at some dolphin skulls. And uh, down here, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Rachel also mentioned looking at living animals today to try and figure out the past. And so I'm not looking at a marine reptile, I'm actually looking at a whale jaw, a very strange kind of whale called a beaked whale. And as I mentioned, we think that the marine reptiles had a lifestyle similar to whales today. So I like to compare uh, the fossil groups to the living groups to get a better understanding of them. And I just want to close up with, I mentioned actually my absolute favorite group of marine reptiles is this group you might never have heard of before called thalatosaurs. Uh, they lived only in the Triassic um, from 250 to 200 million years ago. And they may have been related to ichthyosaurs, but we're not quite sure yet. We're trying to figure that out. They may have been a totally independent group that moved into the ocean and lived uh, for a time before going extinct. They include some large individuals, although they're usually smaller than ichthyosaurs, but this one right here that we just published and described and gave a new name uh, is one of the smallest ones. Um, and I don't have a scale bar, so you don't know, but it's really only uh, a few, it's like about a foot long or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, but not too much uh, bigger than that. So it's a pretty small animal. Um, and this animal had a really pointy snout, lots of sharp teeth. We think it hunted for fish in the ocean during the Triassic. It was found in Alaska, um, actually on uh, tribal lands uh, of the Tlingit people who are native people that live in Alaska. And so with their permission, we actually named this animal after a, a creature from their storytelling and mythology uh, called Gunakadate. And in their uh, mythology, this was a, uh, a sort of magical reptile that lived in the ocean and uh, gave good luck to people who saw it. So we thought that was, since we were lucky to find this fossil, uh, that was a great name. Okay, so a couple questions from uh, the attendees or the participants today. One was, uh, what was the biggest dinosaur and how do we know what they looked like? Um, and so I don't study dinosaurs, but I, I do study animals that lived alongside dinosaurs. So I know a little bit about them. And we're always trying to figure out which was the biggest because oftentimes we don't have a complete skeleton. We've just got parts. But right now, um, one candidate for the very largest dinosaur that's known is Patagotitan, which is a sauropod dinosaur, a long-necked dinosaur uh, that lived in the Cretaceous in South America. And um, this animal is known from leg bones and some, from some backbones, not a complete skeleton, but based on the size of its leg bones, we think uh, that it was um, like 30 meters, so 90 uh, feet long. Uh, and I don't remember the, the weight, but it was very, very heavy. Um, and as far as how we figure out how they, uh, what they looked like, that's a really interesting question. Scientists can make some inferences based on the bones, like uh, where muscles were attached. They give an idea for, for what the animal might have looked like. But for really reconstructing uh, what an animal could have looked like, we get a lot of help from people called paleo artists who study fossils and work with paleontologists to come up with pictures of how they might have looked like. And there's um, both science and art mixed together in figuring this out. This is a reconstruction of one of those sauropod dinosaurs here. And the artist here, Brian Eng, was thinking about turkeys and other animals that have weird um, appendages on them for display and imagining that maybe sauropods had something like that. We don't have evidence for that, but we know that there's lots of similar things in animals today. So it's, it's possible. Um, and then the uh, last question I had here are actually two questions. Uh, are dinosaurs terrible lizards and are pterodactyls dinosaurs? And so if my answers for these, for are dinosaurs terrible lizards? Yes and no, and I'll explain that. And are pterodactyls dinosaurs? Um, the answer to that is, is no, but I'll explain that as well. So the name dinosaur was first invented by this guy, uh, Richard Owen, uh, who was a paleontologist back in the 1800s. And he did come up with a name based on um, Greek words that mean terrible and lizard. And at the time, terrible didn't mean bad. Terrible meant something that was really um, amazing and maybe a little bit scary. And so that was the idea, was that these were, were terrifying reptiles that were very large. 
But it turns out that um, dinosaurs aren't closely related to lizards. They're more closely related to crocodiles, but their closest relatives, and you can see that in the picture uh, here, at least their closest living relatives, are birds. And in fact, birds uh, fit within the family tree of dinosaurs. And so now paleontologists increasingly are saying uh, that birds are dinosaurs. They're the living descendants of dinosaurs and they are technically dinosaurs. So you've seen a dinosaur if you've ever seen a bird before. Pterosaurs are really closely related to dinosaurs. They're cousins of dinosaurs. Uh, pterosaurs include pterodactyls uh, and pteranodon and some other flying reptiles. But um, they evolved flight separately from birds and they are a separate group that is just a cousin of dinosaurs but not actually dinosaurs. That's my whole presentation. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Simon, who'll tell you about even older stuff. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Right. So thank you. Um, so my name is Simon Derrick. And since 2015, I've been a paleontologist at Vanderbilt University. And I do most of my research in Namibia. So Namibia is a country in southwestern Africa and is what you can see in the background of um, this slide here. And as you can probably tell already, Namibia is an incredibly dry and arid, but uh, also an incredibly beautiful country. And the fact that there's not a lot of soil or plants or trees on the top makes it like a, an amazing place to search for fossils. Uh, just makes it incredibly easy. Um, so one of the best things for me about being a paleontologist is be able to explore very remote places. And so I thought that I might start with showing you guys a picture of our field site, uh, one of our field camps. So here we are in a place called Grenz in southern Namibia. And as you can probably tell, we are in the deep, deep desert here. Um, there are no roads, there are no farms, there are no people for hundreds of miles in any direction. So it's an incredibly peaceful and beautiful place to be. Um, over on the right hand side, you can see some of our vehicles that we use to navigate this hazardous terrain. We use some big four by fours. Um, we all sleep and camp in tents uh, for the majority of the field trip. Um, we carry all our food and water with us. Um, and as you can see over here on the left, maybe um, we are cooking dinner. It's about sunset here. So we're cooking ourselves dinner. Over on the far left hand side, you can see one of my students, Brant Gibson who was sort of pointing at me and yelling something. Now, I don't remember what he's saying at this point, but knowing Brandt, he's probably telling me how he wants his steak done. Um, so what are we looking for? Now, if you can look in the background of this picture, and you can see these mountains in the background, these mountains are all made of sandstone. Okay, so sandstone is a rock that forms typically under water, under oceans or seas or lakes or rivers. And some of these layers of sandstone in these mountains create, uh, preserve beautiful ripple marks, just like the sorts of ripple marks you might see if you were to wander out into the, um, into the ocean in the present day. You'd feel these ripple marks underneath your feet that are caused by the moving water. So what we're sitting on here, what we're standing on is the remains of a very, very ancient ocean. Um, an ancient that, uh, ocean that has long since disappeared, and once separated uh, Africa and South America. And one of the best things about being in Namibia and this site is that in between the layers of sandstone are very, very thin layers of volcanic ash. And what's great about volcanic ash is it means we can date these rocks with very, very high precision. So we know as we're walking around the remains of this ancient ocean that we are about 540 million years ago. These rocks are 540 million years old, which is a staggeringly long, long time ago. Um, a long time before the dinosaurs, a long time before whales, a long time before saber-toothed cats. So what fossils do we find? So in this next slide, I'm going to show you just a few of these fossils. And they're all incredibly bizarre looking. So the first thing to note maybe is just how diverse and different looking some of these fossils are. We have things that look a bit like worms. We have things that look a little bit like jellyfish. We have things like this one up here on the top left, Avalofractus, which is sort of beautiful, sort of frond-like frond and looks a bit like a plant. However, for a variety of reasons, we think that these, all these organisms are much more closely related to animals. And they're very, very mysterious. Um, so why mysterious? 
And the reason is because even though we think we know, we think we know that they're related to animals, none of these have any characteristics or any features that are even remotely close to modern day animals, anything you might see in the past. These are all soft bodied things, they're invertebrates, but there's nothing about any of these fossils that would suggest they're related to modern day jellyfish or mollusks or arthropods or crabs or lobsters or anything like that. One of my favorite examples, if you look down in the bottom row, second from left, you'll see a sort of circular fossil. And this is called tribrachidium. And it's one of the weirdest things that paleontologists have ever found in any part of the fossil record. So tri we're looking down on tribrachidium here, and it would have been circular, sort of hemispherical, almost like a uh, tennis ball cut in half. And if you can look at it closely, you can see on the top, there are these three arms that extend out towards the edge of the organism and sort of spiral around in a counterclockwise fashion. So this was an early animal living in a shallow ocean 540 million years ago, but it has a body plan, it has a design that nothing alive today has anything similar. So we don't know where many of these organisms fit in the tree of life. We don't know what they're related to. And even more mysteriously, these organisms disappear about 539 million years. So they appear at 570 million years ago, and then by 539 million years ago, they're all extinct. And immediately afterwards in the rock record, we find a huge abundance of fossils that belong to animal groups that we do recognize. We start to find sponges, we start to find uh, jellyfish, we start to find brachiopods, we start to find shells. Uh, and this is what we call the Cambrian explosion. But what we're looking at here, these mysterious fossils, which we refer to as the Ediacara biota, uh, represent the first flourishings of complex life. So, if we can work out what these fossils are, what they represent, how they're related to modern organisms and where they went, we can get a handle on why and how complex life really sort of flourished on this planet. And by extension, actually, if we work out how and when these evolved, then we can actually sort of start hazarding a guess at our, the likelihood of us finding complex life on other planets elsewhere in the solar system. Um, and maybe even what we might begin to look for. So at the moment, we have a rover up on Mars, um, which is driving around and it's looking for life on other planets. And one of the people driving that rover is a paleontologist who began, work, began his career working on the diacrons. So this is truly sort of astrobiology. So um, with that, um, I think there are a couple of questions which I'll try to do my best to answer. So how do fossils get buried in the ground? And what types of rocks preserve fossils particularly well? It's a very good question. So fossils get buried in the ground. I mean, in order, to, in order for something to become a fossil, um, typically it has to be buried under sediment. And places where sediment is accumulating, um, very often, most often involve water. If you could think about it, like in the oceans or in lakes or in rivers, places like that. Anywhere where there is soft sediment that is moving around, then things can become buried. Um, and then if you're very lucky, um, over millions of years, that, that fossil will become buried deeper and deeper in the sediment. And then it will eventually be caught in an episode of mountain building, or there will be sea level rise or change. And then weathering and erosion will bring that fossil back up to the surface. Um, I guess ideally in your backyard where you can find it and study it. So what types of rocks preserve fossils particularly well? So just think about the sorts of sediments that accumulate in um, aquatic environments, places like oceans, lakes, and rivers. Um, you're thinking pretty often sandstones. Um, typically the finer grain, the better. Really fine sandstone is very, very good. Um, that's because sandstone can be moved about very easily um, by water, and therefore it can bury the dead remains of shells and organisms very easily. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to limestone. So limestone is made of uh, calcium carbonate, a different mineral to sandstones. Um, it's the one that's white colored. And many organisms actually build their shells out of calcium carbonate as well. Things like corals and uh, clams and all sorts of other things. And so if you look at limestone, actually, you'll find that an awful lot of limestone, especially limestone that is less than 500 million years old, is almost entirely made out of shells. So if you see chunks of limestone about the place, 
um, pick them up, take a look under uh, a magnifying lens, or just sort of poke around, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of fossils in there. Um, second question here. What is the oldest bone you have found and where was it found? Okay, this is a tricky question because technically um, I don't find bones at all. Um, what we think of as bones belong to animals that we call vertebrates. Okay, these are things with a backbone or a notochord. Um, so everything that we've heard about so far, far um, Dr. Kelly's, Dr. Rasco's, and Dr. DeSantis's fossils, these are all vertebrates. These are things with a backbone. Um, I study things without backbones, okay, soft body things, or things with sort of an external shell, and we call these invertebrates. Um, so I don't think I've ever found a bone at all, um, unless you're counting the sort of chicken bones I see outside the museum every day. But um, in terms of the oldest fossil I've ever found, um, in South Africa, I found um, a stromatolite. So a stromatolite you can think of as a small reef made by algae and bacteria, sort of about a foot across. Um, and after we sort of did a little bit of research on this, this stromatolite turned out to be two, two and a half billion years old. So that is staggeringly ancient, more ancient even than the fossils I usually study. Um, so, I mean, there are older fossils out there. That is certainly the oldest thing I've ever found. And so with that, I think we have um, a live Q&A. Um, so everyone, um, if you have questions for us, um, we'd love to answer them for you. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Larissa now. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. Great, thank you so much. So Simon, if you can stop sharing your screen. And the first question um, I'm going to have goes to Rachel. Um, so how are plaster bones made or casts of fossils? Oh, um, so basically, I guess you, you, there's various ways to do it. Um, uh, you make a you can take the original fossil or bone and um, we use various kinds of casting materials, sometimes some form of plastic. And you basically just use the original fossil. You, you might have to um, put some uh, kind of like surface Vaseline or something to make sure that the fossil itself isn't damaged um, during the process. And then you can, um, and then you basically make a mold. It doesn't take that long sometimes. Sometimes it takes a couple of days. And then that makes the mold that you can then fill with whatever you want to make the cast um, from. You can also use CT these days if you have a scan of a fossil or whatever you're interested in. Uh, you can then use 3D printing, which is a modern technique a lot of people are using for um, uh, making casts of uh, various uh, anatomical features they're interested in. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, how did dinosaurs, and I'm going to preface this by saying um, non-avian dinosaurs, uh, which are dinosaurs that aren't birds that are alive today that Dr. Neil talked about. So how did dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, go extinct? This is for Dr. Neil. Yeah, so obviously ever since uh, people discovered dinosaurs, they wondered if they were, might still be living somewhere undiscovered on Earth. and. And once we explored most of the planet and it was clear that they had gone extinct, um, people wondered where they went and how they died. And there have been many, many ideas over the years. Um, but in the last 30 years or so, um, most scientists have accept, come to the conclusion based on some evidence uh, that, that there was a very large meteorite impact in the area that is um, the Yucatan Peninsula near the Gulf of Mexico today and a, a space rock the size of the island of Manhattan uh, collided with Earth. And this would have sent up a huge cloud of debris, blocked out the sun for a time, made some giant tsunamis and forest fires as little bits of uh, burning rocks fell back down to Earth from the debris cloud. Uh, and so there's an idea that that impact wiped out dinosaurs and some marine reptiles in the ocean and ammonites and uh, pterosaurs and actually a whole range of groups of animals, but uh, mammals and birds and turtles and snakes survived some other things. Great, thank you. Um, so I have another one for uh, Dr. Simon and it is, 
how does the modern classification system help you identify fossils? Ooh, why do you have to ask me that one? Um, so, that's tricky, let me think about this. So the modern classification system allows us to divide the world up into sort of broad sort of categories of organ organisms that share a sort of common body plan. And so when we find ancient mysterious fossils in the, far, like in, in the fossil record, um, our first port of call is usually to say, well, what parts of this organism shares what we call characters or sort of anatomical features with things we do recognize today? So even if the rest of the organism looks totally bizarre, sometimes it has one character that we can recognize. A great example of this is actually is, is Archaeopteryx. So Arche Archaeopteryx was a, um, an early bird, um, but it had, so it had feathers like a bird and it had teeth like a dinosaur. And so once these things started showing up in sort of quarries, people thought they were a fake. But it turns out that this was sort of one of these supposed, you know, one of these many missing links between um, dinosaurs and birds that Neil alluded to earlier. So it, in this case, it was the character of feathers and the character of teeth, like it allowed us to sort of put together the, the idea that you know, birds are dinosaurs and they share a sort of a common evolutionary history. Once you get back to as, uh, as far back as the things I study, then that sort of falls apart because none of the organisms I study share any characters, as many characters, if any, with modern ones. And so in that respect, my lab has to use different sorts of tricks in order to work out what things are related to because they're so old and so ancient. Great, thank you. Um, so I was asked one that was perfectly suited for me, which is, how did saber-toothed cats hunt? Um, and this is actually something that we actively study. So we can actually look at their morphology um, and what we know about saber-toothed cats based on comparing them to living cats today, living big cats, is that they were not hunting like cheetahs. Um, they were more of an ambush predator, um, potentially trying to stalk their prey. And from, if you can remember the drill that I was using on those teeth, we've also done that with saber-toothed cat teeth. And that can tell us what kind of prey that they're eating. And the type of prey that they like to eat the most are those that hang out in forests or denser cover. Um, so the herbivores are eating lots of leaves and the carnivores are eating those herbivores. Um, and so we, we think that they're really using a lot of cover um, to actually hunt and take down their prey, at least at Rancho La Brea and also um, at, at the La Brea Tar Pits, essentially where I'm at currently or virtually. Um, and also uh, in Florida, we see a similar sort of pattern. They also really like the cover. And I couldn't miss the opportunity to um, show an example of a saber-toothed cat here. So this is a cast. So uh, Dr. Rachel had mentioned um, that we can make an exact replica. So this is not an actual fossil, but it's based off of an exact replica. So literally, just like you do with the Play-Doh, you can make a copy, you can fill it in, and this is a saber-toothed cat. So go predators. All right. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Neil, and it's, did dinosaurs have feathers? Right, excellent question. And actually, uh, uh, Dr. Simon was just kind of alluding to this as well. Um, and I suspect many of you are aware that um, we have now discovered dinosaur fossils that preserve feathers. And this was surprising maybe at first, but uh, helped us to realize that that link between birds and dinosaurs is really close. And so birds weren't the first animals uh, to evolve, develop feathers, but the feathers first appeared on dinosaurs. And because birds are a type of dinosaur, they inherited the feathers and they learned how to use them for flying. But originally dinosaurs probably had feathers for keeping them warm uh, in cold climates and maybe for display uh, to communicate with each other and uh, find one another um, and yeah, so that, that's, that is true. Dinosaurs had feathers. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Rachel. Um, and sort of, I'm gonna put two questions in one. One is, um, how can you distinguish different bones from one another? And also what bones are found, or when bones are found, why are the bones of the entire body sort of scattered around in many cases or not always found? 
the first question is how can you tell what bone is what? Is that the question again? Um, so that is um, again kind of based on what we know from modern animals. We um, anatomists like myself um, study human anatomy, any animal's anatomy, um, vertebrate particularly in my case, and so we know the names of pretty much every bone in the body. Um, and so and all those bones, because vertebrates all share a common ancestor, have uh, the same basic bone for certain, uh, in different parts of the body that basically match up um, with each other. So uh, we can use what we know from modern animals, basically it's, all, it's called comparative anatomy uh, to determine what a bone is in a fossil that we're looking at, for example. And why are bones sometimes found uh, distributed oddly? That's kind of gets back to something Dr. Simon said, which is um, during the fossilization process, uh, sometimes uh, often it's um, things are fossilized in an aquatic situation. And so some things get moved around. Also part of the decay process um, causes that. So in the case of whales, for example, they, they're bodies in life typically have a lot of fat and um, other tissues and some other things, uh, weird uh, internal things going on. So like during the fossilization process, something will die and um, sometimes the, their body will uh, uh, excrete things into different directions than you might expect. So um, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's, there's a video of like an exploding whale, um, uh, on the internet if you're interested in that but that's an example of kind of more extreme example of how kind of stomach contents can gas can um, kind of uh, build up and then cause things to sort of go in a lot of different directions so that's like an extreme example of it but that's basically what happens in the vertebrate context usually great thank you so much um so I have a question for myself, which is um, how do you know when you found a fossil versus something else? Or how can you tell the difference between fossils? So if we were in person, I would call a volunteer up and I would have them hold both of these bones in their hand at the same time. And as you can see, one bone is bigger than the other. Okay, and if you were to hold both of these, um, what you would actually tell me is this one, the smaller bone, is actually heavier than this bone. And that's because what a fossil is, and this is I'm taking from a, a Dr. Seuss modified book, is when bone turns to stone. Um, and so essentially it's getting filled in with lots of little tiny minerals. And I'm going to grab another bone here, which is a giant um, part of a proboscidean or a large elephant-like animal that lived in the past. And you can see that it's starting to kind of fill in and it's very, very heavy. I'm having a hard time lifting this. And so a fossil really is all those little pore spaces in the, um, in the bone are getting filled in with little minerals. So as the water comes through, it deposits these little minerals and it solidifies over time. And that's essentially what a fossil is, um, is it's, it's stone. It's very, very heavy compared to a modern bone. So um, if you're ever wondering and you see what looks like, say, a cow bone, you can lift it. And if it's very light, there's a good chance it's a modern bone. And if it's very heavy, it's a good chance it's a fossil. Now, that, that doesn't always hold true, but for the most part, um, it gets mineralized and that's what a fossil is. Um, so great question. All right. Um, so we have another question, um, and this is for uh, Dr. Simon. And uh, the question is, I'm finding all of these little like seashell like things in my backyard in Nashville. Um, were we underwater? And what was, what sort of fossils are these from? And I'll, I'll give Simon a hint since he hasn't seen the fossils. Uh, they are brachiopods. Um, so if you can kind of describe what Nashville was like um, in the Ordovician, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, Nashville and actually much of central Tennessee is built on top of uh, 470 million year old limestones that actually record Ordovician aged uh, a lot of like a lot of fossil reefs. Um, so if you are able to sort of walk around Percy Warner Park um, or just anywhere where there's construction happening and there's a lot of construction happening, 
then uh, and you look at the, the chunks of limestone coming out of the bedrock, then yeah, it is full of shells. So you can find an awful lot of different invertebrate sort of reef type fossils around Nashville. Uh, the majority of you, which will be what you have already, brachiopods. So these are small shells, like bivalve shells. They look a bit like clams, but they're not actually very closely related to clams. Um, they're not, yeah, not closely related at all. Um, but inside those little shells will be a little organism um, and it will be sucking water in and filtering food particles out of the water there. Other things you can find are corals. Um, there are beautiful sponges. Um, and even um, we call giant orthocones. So these would have been things a little bit like squid that lived in a mineralized uh, cone-like shell, sometimes up to several feet long. And these would have been sort of fierce predators in Ordovician age seas um, swimming over this reef. So yeah, good question. Lots of fossils in Nashville. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, we've gotten so many amazing questions. We've tried to answer as many as we possibly can. We're gonna wrap up here, but I wanted to ask every single one of our paleontologists a really important one, which is why did you become a paleontologist? So we're gonna rotate around. Um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Simon and, I'll, and then uh, work backwards through time, bringing us back to the present. Um, and we'll have, we'll have each of them speak to this question. So why did you become a paleontologist? That's a good question. Um, I think that it's something that I probably share with all of you, uh, and that is the thrill of discovery. So as a paleontologist, you can be outside in your backyard, you'll be, you could be in southern Namibia, you can be backstage at a museum and be the first person to see something. You know, that organism would have laid undescribed and sort of unfound for you know, anything up to sort of 500 million years, and you could be the first person to find it and describe it. Um, and that thrill never really went away for me. And the fact that I get a, to do a job now where I get to travel around the world finding fossils, I, I am just profoundly grateful for. Okay, I think I'm next. Um, absolutely everything that Dr. Simon just said, uh, and, and actually some of my best discoveries haven't been outside, but uh, going through old museum collections, opening a drawer and finding something that maybe somebody picked up 50 or 100 years ago and set aside and nobody else has really looked at it or looked at it with the right eyes to, to realize how important it is. Um, but more generally, uh, as a kid, I was just really fascinated by animals, by the living world, by being outside, by dinosaurs and fossils. Uh, and so I kind of tried to pursue all of that through school and college and, and took biology classes and took geology classes. And it just kind of naturally emerged that the skills that I was building and developing led me towards this career. Yeah, for me, uh, it was kind of the same. I really loved dinosaurs when I was a kid growing up. And um, then I uh, also, I w was started college and I thought maybe that wasn't a career anyone could really have. Um, and I was also really into computers. And, but then towards the end, I started to, towards the end of being in, at university, I um, decided I should probably do some research because I was interested in uh, doing more kind of science and um, started speaking with the paleontologists in the geology department and, and kind of got in through on the ground floor with uh, CT scanning actually, because where I went to university was uh, one of the first CT scanners that was being used for paleontology. And it was a combination of my interest in art and science and uh, animals, paleontology. And I had got, at the, also, at the same time, I was really getting into whale skulls because I had taken a class on bone uh, anatomy and it was and there was a whale skull and it was just amazing it was the only one that they had but um so then then it was pretty much uh, downhill from there and i've been lucky enough to keep uh working on fossil and modern whales and other marine mammals great thank you um so for me i was always very curious and i grew up taking summer classes at the los angeles museum of natural history on dinosaurs and snakes and electricity and, and just really love science. But honestly, when I went off to college, I didn't think I was going to be a paleontologist. I thought I was going to be a politician, ironically. Um, and it was through just a random class that sparked my curiosity. And, and I sort of went, wait, I remember paleontology 
really realize there were real jobs in this and there were um, and I got the bug I couldn't shake it at the time um, paleontology was very different from conservation biology and I was really torn between studying modern animals and trying to help our current ecosystem and studying the fossil past which I found absolutely fascinated and who doesn't like studying and working on dinosaurs it was amazing um, but fortunately for me those two fields have really come together and so I like to call myself a conservation conservation paleobiologist. And so I ask questions that are of direct relevance to the fossil or direct relevance to modern conservationists, but that use the fossil record to help answer those questions. So um, I really feel like I get to be both a conservation biologist and a paleontologist. And just to echo what Dr. Simon said, it's, I, it's a blessing to be able to travel all over the world. We work on every continent except for Antarctica um, and to study the most amazing fossils. And the last thing I I just want to mention is anyone can be a paleontologist. So anyone from any ethnicity, from any gender, um, from any walk of life. And what I kept pretty private for a long time, um, but I used to have epilepsy. So, you know, if you have a learning disability, a physical disability, there are still ways you can fo study fossils. You can be out in the field, you can study them uh, from your computer. We're all paleontologists working, you know, on, on from fossils, digitizing fossils and being able to study them from our living room. So um, it's really, the most amazing field. Um, you know, if you have any interest in it all, I encourage you to just pursue your curiosity. You can do it. You can be a paleontologist. Um, it's a great career. And thank you all very much for joining us. I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Rachel, Dr. Simon, Dr. Neil, for being here. I want to thank the Evolutionary Studies Initiative for sponsoring this event. And thank all of you kids for attending this and I would just encourage you to go outside, get excited about fossils. And, you know, right now, especially, you can travel to far off places by learning about these incredible ancient animals. So thank you so much. We will make this recording live on National Fossil Day, which is on Wednesday. So look forward to other events happening um, virtually as far as, as long as as well as at other local museums. So keep an eye out for those. Celebrate National Fossil Day. And thank you so much for being here today. Thanks again. Bye.